I assumed Real Housewives of DC was going to be boring, being that there was only one season, and it's the only Housewives that's ever been officially cancelled. Well, it turns out that I was wrong. It's all kinds of scandalous. Hey guys, it's me, Takani, and today we're doing a deep dive into The Real Housewives of DC. The Real Housewives is an American reality TV franchise that is owned by Bravo, a TV network owned by NBC. Everything in this video is my own opinion and interpretations. I watched this series on Peacock, and I recommend that you watch it or read the sources in the description and form your own opinions. I also know how to plead the fifth. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Chapter 1. Meet the Salahis. Before we get into the absolutely juicy scandal that caused Housewives of DC to be cancelled, let me introduce you to the Salahis. Tark and Mikkel are... something. I don't know how else to explain them other than an SNL skit come to life. They feel like a parody of a power couple, desperate to climb the social ladder and inviting themselves to parties just so they can post on Facebook that they sniffed the president as he walked by. They wanted to be known, and in 2009, they certainly were. Chapter 2. A Tale of Two Realtors Before crashing the White House party, Mr. and Mrs. Salahi hired Stacy to be their realtor so they could do some house hunting. They looked at a few million dollar homes. In order for her to show them more homes, she'll need a letter of credit from their bank. But of course, the Salahis never sent the letter of credit, and they blamed Stacy for not emailing them and asking for it. She calls them out and said that they had a conversation in person about it, and she asked for it because she didn't want to waste her time showing them homes if they weren't buying. Tark must have been a little annoyed about the wasting her time comment, because he just starts shouting, You want the truth? You want the truth? The truth is, we had another real estate agent looking for us, and Stacy knew it. Why waste her time then if you already have another realtor? Andy brings up that Stacy wrote in her blog about Salahism, a new word that she had defined. It's a mental state of delusion, similar to narcissism. And Michelle gets upset hearing that and tells Stacy to be gracious and be a lady. Then Tariq starts to cut in and talk in circles, and Stacy's like, I don't want to hear this anymore, and cuts him off. I don't judge people like you, Stacy. I wouldn't devote my whole blog. Oh, I didn't devote it, honey. You're not that important. Let's leave the honey out because I am not your honey. But let's just be real, gracious, and a lady. The fact is, we did nothing wrong. I really don't want to hear about that again. You beat that horse. Salahiism. Delusion. <sighs> you guys hijacked our show. And what about our lives? It's been horrific to go through. Everyone here has something going on in their lives. Our whole life got tore up. Karma. I just love how Mary called this whole situation karma for all the things that the Salahis did, and we haven't even covered the juicy stuff. Andy asks the ladies if Michelle uses her wine to climb the social ladder and to get access to people and events. I guess he assumed since they have their own winery that they would be donating wine to these events that they're attending. But it turns out they just show up without it. Chapter 3, No Wine Despair. Andy brings up a party that the Salahis offered to host for their friend Paul Wharton, but it was discovered that after the party, they had their attorney email Paul and tell him that they won't be paying for any of the party costs. They then start droning on about how they were one of four hosts and how they donated wine. Andy retorts that the head of the venue said that they didn't receive any wine from the Salahis. The Salahis obviously deny it and say that they dropped off the wine that morning. Then Mary chimes in and says that nobody was drinking Oasis wine. Tark just responds, okay, and then they move on. On top of not donating wine or covering costs on a party that they offered to host, they also, allegedly, love to hire vendors and throw a large, extravagant, expensive party just to file bankruptcy to avoid paying them. That's just what was said on the show by a viewer, allegedly. But a viewer wrote in and brought up the over 30 cases involving the Salahis, or Oasis Enterprises, since 2004, most dealing with unpaid vendors. In 2009, they filed bankruptcy owning $900,000 in debt and just, allegedly, stiffed all of the vendors. Tark corrects Andy. And he says that actually it was only Oasis Enterprises that filed for bankruptcy. And that new companies are already being formed. Ugh, I would love to play with rich people money. How are you going to be a million dollars in debt but still forming new companies? 
I don't know anything about bankruptcy, but luckily for me, Tark decides to explain it to all of us. This is how it works. When you go into bankruptcy protection, you don't pay your bills. In fact, you're not even allowed to. So yeah, that's a part of bankruptcy. A lot of people don't get paid. You know what? You're throwing around companies. At the end of the day, as a decent human being and a business person, you pay bills. It's about being legally correct. No, it's not about that. It's about if you take a service, you commit to pay a business a bill. You honor that and you pay that bill. I'm sorry, Stacy. That's incorrect. That would be improper. It seems like the Salahi should just stop hiring people if they're not going to pay them. You don't need all this fancy bull larky. Just get some cheese and meats from Aldi's and cut them up in a little tray. Boom, you've got a charcuterie board. And that's all any good party needs. A little bit of snacks and good company. Plus, they own a winery. They can literally just bring their own wine. Well, maybe there's a reason that they don't take wine to venues. It turns out that when Tark had a glass of wine, he decided to waste it. Chapter 4, The Wine Tossing. At a party, Linda and Kat were sitting down at this very long 12-person table, and they heard screaming. As Linda looks up, she realizes that it's Tark screaming at two women. I just said, Tark, do you mind keeping it down? And he told me to shut the F up. I looked back at him and I said, no, you shut the F up. To which he threw a glass of red wine in my face. A full glass of wine in your face. And I picked up a glass of water. I would never waste scotch on you. Ever. And then you go on television eight hours later and say that the reason he did that was because I was attacking you. That's when I realize you are both habitual violators. Linda has a history of being very abusive to Mikkel, and I am a protective husband. Especially because of Mikkel's MS. And when somebody has MS and you attack them verbally, it doesn't just affect her emotionally, it affects her physically. Is that what happened that night? I was talking to your wife? She jumps in seven people away and wants to be involved in the conversation. I was there, and that's That's exactly what happened. And you shoved your wife before you threw the wine in my face. You are slime. And did you throw a glass of wine in her face? I did. Linda got up to stop you from abusing those women. Even Mikkel tried to stop you, at which you pushed her. I had heard you shoved her. I'm protective of Mikkel because she has MS. Oh, wow. You know what? That doesn't excuse bad behavior. You're the one with poor behavior, ma'am. Oh, excuse me. You are excused. After talking over each other for a while, Mikkel woes everybody to shut up. She demands Tark apologize, but then she turns the situation around to be about herself. Whoa, whoa, go right ahead. Lie. Tariq was going to call and apologize to you the next morning. And I think, whoa, if you could just apologize now. I'm sorry I threw wine at you, Linda. And Linda, you need to apologize to me for saying I have an eating disorder. I do not. I will never apologize to you. The fact that I even breathe the air you breathe is a gift from God. He has you captive in the basement, handcuffed to a dresser drawer, and anyone who doesn't see that is delusional. And is that what you believe? Absolutely, Andy. I did not see that transition coming. The whip from, my husband will apologize to you, But now it's your turn to apologize to me. Man, that left me a little dizzy. Tark is really going hard bringing up Mikkel's diagnosis as an excuse for everything. Maybe it's about time I mention the book. Chapter 5, I think? The book and MS. Before we get into this chapter, I'd like to quickly say that I am not speculating on Mikkel's MS diagnosis. If she says she has MS, I 100% believe her. As someone who also struggles with an invisible illness, I'm used to people not believing that I'm sick since I look healthy. So I definitely understand masking through the pain and just pretending to be okay. However, I do agree that it is a little suspect that she decides to bring up her diagnosis now. And she said she wanted to put it in her book to get a jump on the press. What does that even mean? I get that this was 2010. And blogs regularly publish things that were none of anybody's business. But it is a little convenient that she hasn't brought it up till now. And it must be really nice for her that it kind of distracts away from the White House party thing. Linda tries to call her out and says that she has spoken to doctors personally who don't believe that Mikkel has MS. Honestly, I think that any respectable doctor 
probably would decline to answer questions on people's health that aren't their patients. Heck, they probably would decline to answer questions on their patients as well. Because they probably couldn't answer those questions because of HIPAA, but still. You can't diagnose or undiagnose somebody just by looking at them. That's like the whole point of blood tests and stool samples and x-rays and stuff. It's so that they can find problems that are hidden. And people with MS do struggle silently, and most symptoms are unnoticed by those around them. Mikkel then deflects the question like she's a ninja that's acting as a goalkeeper, and she tells Linda to bless herself from within. And then after arguing back and forth about whether Linda asked Mikkel about her diagnosis, she didn't. Mikkel tells Linda that beauty comes from within, and peace comes from within. Linda calls Mikkel out for spinning stories, and says that the timing is suspicious. Mikkel then blames it on Linda for implying that she has an ED, when Linda joked that Paul needed to shop in the children's section for Mikkel. Mary speaks up and tells Mikkel that she needs to use her platform to help the MS Society. Then Mikkel replies, I already have for the last 12 years of my life. I've secretly helped the MS Society here in DC. Kat replies, yeah, real secretly. Mary says that Mikkel should have her doctor confirm her diagnosis publicly. And when Andy asks why, Stacy speaks up and says that a lot of people are questioning Mikkel's diagnosis. And having her doctor come out would be the easiest way to put these rumors to rest. Mikkel then says that this group is the only one questioning her diagnosis and that everywhere else has been loving and supportive. Chapter 6, Mikkel's Low Blow Mikkel accused Kat of making multiple people cry, and then Kat channels her inner owl, asking, Who? Who? Who did I make cry, Mikkel? Who? Mikkel points to Stacy and said, You made Stacy cry. And Stacy's like, She didn't make me cry. And then Mikkel's like, Well, you made Stacy mad. And Kat's like, Who did I make cry, Mikkel? Who? Name him. Name him. Mikkel says, Me. And Kat says, that's only one person. Then Kat points out how quickly Mikkel's tears from earlier have vanished, and she calls her fake. Mikkel decides that this is her moment to take a super low blow and bring up Kat and her husband's divorce. I'm sorry your husband left you. He didn't leave me. If you find love within you, your husband will come back. I don't want him back. Thank you anyway. At least I'm married, Kat, and I have someone that loves me. Thank God. Kat, I'm so sorry you're empty within. You are one angry person. Empty? There's only wind blowing between those two ears, darling. Why are you throwing out such judgmental things? You are the biggest judgmental person of everybody. You're telling her she has no love in her heart. She doesn't. I'm just saying find it within yourself. I don't have love for you, darling. I have love for everyone else in this room. Even all of the crew but I don't have any love for you. I've gone to the UK, and I have never met anyone as rude as you. The British people are amazing. And when it comes to Americans, without a shadow of a doubt, you are the most shallow, insecure American I have ever encountered all over the world. That's your opinion, Kat. Yeah, and it's quite a few other people's opinion. I felt the British people are great except for you thing was very strange. But I kind of love Kat's response because she's just so sassy. It's a shame that she was disinvited from the White House. All because of a scandal caused by the Salahis. And Mikkel's reaction to finding out that Kat got disinvited kind of boggled my mind a little bit. But before we touch on her reaction to Kat being disinvited, maybe it's time that we talk about the Congressional State Dinner Scandal of 2009. Chapter 7, The Big Scandal. The big scandal. In 2009, the White House was hosting a Black Caucus Foundation dinner in honor of Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Since before the dinner, the Salahis had been in contact with their friend Michelle Jones via email and asking to get tickets for the party. Michelle said that she would try to get them tickets. Then, on the day of the dinner, Michelle sent the Salahis an email saying that Due to the weather, the party's been moved inside and the guest list had been shortened. Tark tells Andy that after that email, he had called Michelle's office and her assistant picked up. He asked the assistant what gate that he should arrive at for the party and what time he should show up. 
After a moment on hold, the assistant comes back, tells them the gate, and says, Be there at 6.30 sharp, Mr. Salahi. Tark then proceeds to say that if he wasn't invited, the assistant wouldn't have given him that information. So they were clearly invited to the White House. They arrived at the security check-in gate, and unfortunately their names weren't on the list. The security guard asks them to stand over there, and explains that the party hasn't started yet and that they're early. And then the security guard goes back to checking in other people. The Salahis play it cool, talking about, oh, they're early, yay, and that they don't have to worry about being late, so they're just gonna go down and wait by the gates. And that's all it took to get past security. After a long night of partying and a few photos with the president, the Salahis went home on their own and were definitely not kicked out by security. And they also posted their pictures on Facebook that night. Jason Baki claimed that they were escorted out by Secret Service. And when asked about it, Tark claims that they weren't escorted out by anyone. Not Secret Service, not security, they left on their own. Tark also claims that Jason is a liar and has lied about him about these very vague things that he doesn't want to go into details right now about. Convenient. Then Andy says that Lance Jones, the director of communications for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, said that they were asked to leave by security after it was discovered that they didn't have an invitation. Tark continues to deny it. And then he starts saying that they were actually guests of Paul Gardner. And Tark also says that you don't really need an invitation to go to the White House. Andy then asks straight up, did you have an invitation? And the Salahis admit that they didn't have a physical invitation, and it was all in their emails, which is in the book. Also, I looked, I was going to buy that book, but I am not paying $250, especially when Andy already read it from cover to cover, to cover to cover, to cover to cover again. Andy's like, I didn't see an invite. I saw emails from Michelle Jones saying she was trying to get you tickets. And I could see how someone who's hopeful might misinterpret that as a guarantee. After the Salahis talk in circles, saying that they called, they were told the information, they were invited, they were on the OTR list, which means off the record, they then start to deflect and ultimately end up blaming them leaving early on lentil soup and Mikkel's MS. Have you ever been officially invited to the White House before? I used to work there in the 90s. But no, I've never attended an event. Do you honestly think the White House doesn't send out these beautiful invitations? I'm sure they do, but they also have something called OTR Cat. They do it all the time. But you didn't sit down to eat because you weren't invited. It's so funny that she gets so hostile about it. No, you didn't sit down on the table because you're NFI, not invited. You cost people their jobs and you don't care about anyone else. Nobody lost their job, Cat. Yes, they did! You're delusional! Why email Michelle Jones that night and say we went at 6.30 to check if it had gotten approved? That tells me that you don't even know if you were approved at that point or not. We were always told we were 100% in. It was the dinner portion we were being worked into. I didn't get that from the emails. But you said that came in a phone call? A phone call and communication with our attorney. But you didn't sit down for dinner because there wasn't a seat for you? No, it's because they have lentil soup. I can remember it. You didn't like what they were serving? No, I left because I wasn't feeling well. But you were well enough to post pictures at 1.30 in the morning. I left due to my health, cat. Michelle Jones stated, I specifically stated they didn't have tickets. And in fact, I didn't have authority to authorize the attendance or access to any of the evening's events. Well, I think the emails said it all. She never said any of that in the emails, did she? Michelle Jones didn't say specifically that you were in. She said that she was working on it. But forget all this, because this could take a lot of airtime. The biggest part is, we went there and gave our IDs. If you don't want us, just say bye. Don't put us through all this. The Salahis may have genuinely believed that they were invited, and it was just all a huge misunderstanding. But that didn't stop them from being taken to court by Congress. They were asked if they attended the dinner received an invitation, or if the checkpoint officer verified that their names were on the guest list. Tark pled the fifth every single time. If they asked a question to him, he pled the fifth. Then they decided to get cheeky and asked Tark if he was in the court hearing right now. That was a difficult question, so Tark had to turn around and ask his attorney what to say. Can you guess what he said next? Muy bien! That's right! He pled the fifth! 
The congressmen scolded the Salahis for attending the dinner without an invitation, and gave them a final chance to speak. After one final fifth pled, the consequences? Well, the consequences were... not that much. Basically, they had to resign from their Virginia Tourism Board. They lost sponsors. But it seems like they didn't really face any legal repercussions. In fact, Tark still believes that the White House owes him an apology for ruining his reputation. When the lawyer gave his final statement to the public, he said that the Salahis believed with all their hearts that they were invited to this dinner, and that they have done nothing wrong. And it was a complete misunderstanding from the government side. It seems like their delusion to them being invited and willingness to plead the fifth to every single question asked of them saved them from real consequences. Well, you know what? I believe that in my heart, my local bank wants to give me all the money they have in my little brown sack with a dollar sign on it. Since I believe it, it's true, right? And if they take me to court, I'll just plead the fifth. Or does that only work for rich people? Now, before we end the video, let's rewind to Cat being disinvited because of the Slahi's actions. Chapter 7? Cat was uninvited. Andy asks Kat about being disinvited, and she says it was because of Mikkel and her participation in the show. When Andy asks how Mikkel feels about Kat getting disinvited because of her, well, like I said earlier, her response was really mind-boggling. Anyone can attend, Kat. Anyone can attend the White House Christmas party. Don't tell me you're planning on doing that in a couple months' time. Anyone can get in. I got an email. In fact, it was a text message this time. What I do know is humility, and I don't think President Obama and his office would uninvite you, Kat. Maybe your husband uninvited you. You know shit all about the White House, the administration, anything, so you speak out of Watching you sit with the ladies during the congressional court hearing showed me just how barbaric you are. I mean, you're saying I hope she makes license plates? No, don't blame her. I said that. What I meant was I just hope you pay your dues. Linda, when you wish harm to others, it only comes to you. I'm not wishing you harm, I just want you to behave. After some back and forth between Mikkel and Linda, Stacy's husband Jason asked Tark and Mikkel how it felt being told by Congress that they are shameful. Mikkel of course responds that she looks into everybody's eyes and told them that she did no wrong, that it was all a misunderstanding. And Kat calls her out and says, yeah, you pled the fifth to every question. Andy asked Tark why they didn't answer any questions, and they just kept pleading the fifth. Tark says that they were authorized to answer some questions, but Congress didn't ask those questions. They asked you if you had invitations. Why couldn't you just answer yes? What we were told by the White House is they just needed this to go away, and we respect that. The public wanted to know if it was a publicity stunt for the show. No, they wanted to know if you crashed the White House. No, well, we said that. And Congress was mostly upset that I crashed it to become famous. Oh, what was that, Mikkel? And Congress was mostly upset that I crashed it to become famous. Congress was mostly upset at you for crashing the party to become famous? So you did crash the White House party. Well, folks, that closes the case of whether the Salahis were invited or not. You heard it from Mikkel here first. And then this is the conclusion. After being called out, shown the evidence, and taken to court, the Salahis still believed that they were invited to the White House dinner, and that the government owes them an apology. I don't think they would ever truly admit that they crashed the White House's party, besides Mikkel's little slip-up. This whole thing did teach me one thing, though. If I'm ever in the courts, I'll just plead the fifth until they let me go. Although, I don't plan on being arrested anytime soon. If you made it this far in the video, plead the fifth down in the comments below, or you could send a little shush emoji. We'll know what it means. And thank you guys so much for joining me on this unhinged and completely unnecessary deep dive into the Real Housewives of DC. Don't forget to like or dislike the video, subscribe and turn on those notifications, and check out a few of my other videos on the channel, or even on my Patreon. I'll see you next time. Bye guys!